To my surprise, there was no mention of Pokemon at all during E3. Despite there being two major title releases in less than a year's time, seemed rather concerning but I guess they were saving their shot for the Pokemon Direct dropping this week, which I plan to stream so definitely drop by to say hi. In this video I want to explore a game that recently came out, namely Monster Hunter Stories 2, to shed a light on what that game manages to accomplish that Pokemon as a series would greatly benefit from as well. Exploration has always been a key hallmark for any self-respecting RPG in their attempt to immerse the player into the world laid out before them. Uncovering hidden secrets and unlocking new areas are some of the most enjoyable and rewarding experiences in gaming, and is what makes role-playing games so enticing to play. Pokemon of old accomplished this in a clever way that took advantage of their main appeal, the namesake of their series. They had the player go out and capture monsters, and then have the player use those very same monsters to advance the plot forward through the use of of hidden machines, or HMs for short. The HM system, while far from perfect, does a great job of neatly tying many different facets of the game together. It allows the monsters that the player captures to have a tangible effect on the world at large, all the while granting increasing agency to the player throughout the runtime of the game. HMs were, unfortunately, rather clunky and outdated, and in dire need of reformation. Pokemon X and Y flirted with this idea by introducing Pokemon you could ride on to help you traverse certain terrain, such as Rhyhorn or Mamoswine to conquer rocky or snowy areas respectively. Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire introduced Soaring, allowing the player total freedom to command the skies. Pokemon Sun and Moon culminated on the idea of rideable Pokemon, eventually evolving into the Poker Ride system. Yes, Daddy! A complete overhaul with HMs being abandoned altogether. Instead of requiring semi-permanent attacks that were largely underwhelming in battle and a hassle to work around with in the overworld, Poker Ride gave the player access to a handful of rideable Pokemon that executed specific actions. This was a fantastic improvement, with the main criticism being that players failed to resonate with the ride Pokemon, due to them being random mons given to you as opposed to allowing the player to use their very own monsters that they personally captured and raised. Let's Go went with the secret technique system. The partner Pikachu or Eevee is able to perform various different actions in place of HMs, a near perfect system that addresses many of the issues of past systems, with lack of variance being the main concern. Sword and Shield took a different approach but was ultimately a significant regression compared to all of the aforementioned systems. They brought back the bike despite riding Pokemon being better in every single way. The bike was also made able to surf on water, but again, surfing on Pokemon is more enjoyable. Surf is the only traversal tool preserved from previous titles. Everything else, from Cut to Rock Smash, was removed. The consequence of removing these tools, which contributed a significant deal to world exploration, is that exploration becomes one-dimensional and is essentially inconsequential as a result, a huge component of the series rendered near obsolete. Secrets are non-existent with few exceptions, and the world becomes increasingly linear, having the unfortunate side effect of making the world as a whole feel smaller, which is ironic because Sword and Shield introduces some of the largest areas in the series. The charming and playful aspect of Pokemon interacting with the world was greatly lost in Sword and Shield, which is extremely disappointing and is a sorely missed opportunity after crafting such expansive open areas. This brings us to Monster Hunter Stories 2, which managed to perfect the field progression system that Pokemon was striving for. Monsters born and raised by your hand can seamlessly assist you in your journey. Whether you need to move around the map faster, jump a great distance, or swim through the water, you're able to depend on your own monsty buddies to give you a hand and help you out. This incentivizes the player to seek out a wide variety of different monsties to diversify their team, and encourages return visits to places you've been to before to access areas that were previously inaccessible. Pokemon would benefit a great deal by implementing this simple yet effective system that would contribute greatly to bringing both the world and the Pokemon that reside within to life in a meaningful and enjoyable way. Pokemon BDSP are rumored to be extremely faithful recreations of Diamond and Pearl. If that's the case, then it's more likely than not that HMs will be returning in some capacity. I'm intrigued to see how ILCA approaches that prospect. If it's as literal as the rumor suggests, then I can only imagine how many people would be extremely displeased. I've mentioned it before a few times in past videos so I will be brief. The Pokemon seen in the wild area are underwhelming, 
to say the least. Things don't seem to be improved in any way based on the only available footage we have of Legends Arceus thus far. Monster Hunter Stories 2 addresses this issue by implementing yet another simple, yet highly effective element into their games. Monsters can be seen doing normal everyday things, like eating or sleeping. Seems trivial at first, but it does a great job of grounding the creatures to their environments, tethering them to the world and the process. Game Freak already has access to both sleeping and eating animations for every single Pokemon in the game, so it would be nice to see them utilize those assets in organic ways to help breathe some much needed life into the Pokemon when visible in the overworld. The developers of modern Pokemon games are alleged to care so much about the player's time that the games are intentionally sabotaged in order for the player to put the Pokemon game down faster so that they can get back to their free mobile games. Respecting the player's time is so important that Pokemon League champions are savagely gimped to the point where their Pokemon don't even have 4 attacks. You're led to believe that respecting the player's time is of the utmost importance in a Pokemon game, so much so that it warrants entire games being dumbed down to insulting degrees even children would scoff at. And yet, rudimentary and extremely convenient time-skipping tools are nowhere to be found, despite the series being over two decades old with over 35 titles to choose from. Sword and Shield finally granted the player the ability to skip cinematic cutscenes, but even that was implemented in the most convoluted way imaginable. Like, you either have the ability to keep the cutscenes on or you're forced to turn all of them off via a toggle in the options menu for some reason, as opposed to, you know, doing it the way it's been done in modern games for many years now. There was only a small handful of cutscenes in Sword and Shield to begin with anyways, so this was ultimately a negligible, poorly implemented last minute addition. The main issue, especially with recent Pokemon titles, are the unskippable dialogue boxes which constitutes like 90% of the game, rendering the vast majority of the campaign unskippable, which is downright painful if the player attempts any additional playthroughs, and is antithetical to respecting the player's time. So, when Hop is droning on and on and on about pointless things you don't care about, there's nothing you can do except spam the A button until he goes away, only to stop you moments later so that you can repeat the process. A simple skip feature fixes this very obnoxious issue. Monster Hunter, like most other games out there, actually respects the player's time by allowing them to skip any and all cutscenes, whether cinematic or strictly dialogue. This actually came in handy for my very first playthrough because I played the demo, but wanted to start over on a fresh save. I was able to breeze through the opening tutorial in 20 minutes as opposed to 2 hours due to being granted the ability to skip story beats at my discretion. Speaking of respecting players time, let's take a look at the battles. The battles in Monster Hunter can be sped up with three varying degrees depending on how fast or slow you want to go. Once again, perfectly demonstrating the value of actually respecting the player's time without insulting the player or compromising the experience. The battles themselves, from the combat to the animations, are quick, snappy, and satisfying. This game has Z-move style attacks that are extra flashy and deal tons of damage. You can skip those too if you want. Can you imagine how nice it would be to be able to skip the Dynamax transformation cinematic after seeing it for the 1000th time? Pokemon battles, by contrast, are actually slower than they were over two decades ago on the original Game Boy, surprisingly enough. Despite there being over 30 titles in the ongoing series, they all play relatively the same way with very little innovation or substantial improvements considering how long it's been. Like, there's no reason something like this should be released in the year 2019. Why is it so slow? Why does it show the animation, stop to deal damage, and then repeat this over and over for each subsequent hit? For the Game Boy games, you could argue it was due to a multitude of limitations at the time, but why is it still like that? We live in a world where games are unimaginable orders of magnitude more complex and capable than they were 20 years ago. Yet Pokemon, the highest grossing franchise on this blue rock, can't process successive hits one after another without awkwardly pausing in between each. While 
Multi-hit attacks like these are relatively rare, it's just one example of many archaic Game Boy elements still somehow finding their way into modern titles. The fact that this is a thing at all to begin with is cause for concern regardless. One simple solution is to have the damage dealt at the same time as the animation, as opposed to after, which is precisely what Pokemon Battle Revolution on the Wii managed to pull off. Hopefully future Nintendo Switch Pokemon titles will be able to accomplish something similar. Even if everything remains slow and clunky, Pokemon would especially benefit from having the ability to, at the very least, fast forward matches if desired. This would come in extra handy for those that wish to grind. Pokemon, despite all of its flaws, actually rests atop an extremely robust and mechanically deep battle system. You wouldn't actually know this though if you were just a casual player who runs through the game a single time due to its extremely shallow implementation, which is honestly a real shame and a criminal squandering of potential. This is because most Pokemon titles only demand players to engage with surface level mechanics, that being the type system. But Pokemon is so much more than just the type system. I've been playing Pokemon for a long time and I still learn something new about it by watching some of my favorite players like Envy and Weedle Twinedle. For example, did you know that if you use Mean Look on a Phalanx that it will be able to use No Retreat more than once? No? Neither did I, at least until I saw Weedle's video on it. How cool would it be if you ran into neat hidden tech like this in game? Granted this is a double battle strategy and there aren't many double battles to begin with, which is another problem in and of itself to be honest. Or how about knowing what a rank target even is, an item that removes all of the holder's type immunities. Such a fascinating concept that only rarely comes to light when players are feeling saucy in online Pokemon battle simulators. More offhand strategies like tricking ring targets onto opposing Pokemon is perfect material for in-game battles, freshening up the beyond stale gameplay recycled generation after generation. Instead of preoccupying themselves with explosive battle gimmicks, Game Freak should focus their creative efforts into crafting fun battles by dusting off mechanics already in place that are hardly, if ever, put into practice. If you scroll down MV's channel, video after video contains cool and interesting techniques or battle strategies that would be infinitely more compelling to incorporate into a Pokemon game than the overwhelmingly exhausted and creatively bankrupt approach of monotype trainers featured in every Pokemon title ever. There's so much more I want to say about this, but we'll probably save it for another time in a video dedicated to this topic. On the other hand, Monster Hunter Stories 2 does an excellent job of not only challenging the player by encouraging them to adopt all of the game mechanics, but rewards them for taking the time to learn the intricacies that the game has to offer. With some enemies simply being too overwhelming regardless of your breadth of knowledge of the game, giving you something to strive for and overcome. I have an excellent first-hand experience that illustrates this point perfectly. I took a side quest where I needed to take down a tough boss called the Flying Fury. The Flying Fury, when enraged, uses an attack called Hyper Vacuum to form change where it puffs out its neck and is able to dish out very powerful attacks each turn that become increasingly more difficult to manage the longer the battle draws on. I knew of one countermeasure, which was to throw an item known as the Flash Bomb in its face in order to temporarily deflate it, reverting its form change and thereby avoiding massive damage. This was, however, only a temporary solution. The problem was that once I ran out of these items, I wasn't able to outmuscle the creature when it eventually form changed again, even though I was using super effective attacks by winning head to heads. Relying on the rudimentary attack type chart and attempting to abuse it wasn't enough. I proceeded to get run over, resulting in my inevitable demise. I took a step back in order to reassess what I could do better in order to emerge victorious. If strictly winning head to heads wasn't enough, then I needed something more. I went into the notes provided by the game itself, something Pokemon should learn from as well, and came across a double attacks, something I did by accident a few times but didn't fully understand. Turns out, double attacks are very powerful as it deals damage while completely preventing your opponent from attacking, exactly what I needed to stave off damage long enough to take the monster down. Double attacks not only require you to choose the correct attack type, but your monster buddy needs to be synced up with you by choosing the same attack type as well. The double attack strategy came through and I was finally able to fell the wild beast that had done me in just moments before. It was such an incredibly satisfying and rewarding experience, taking several different tools offered by the game, understanding them, melding them together, and then executing them in a plan of action to overcome a challenging obstacle while having a blast throughout the whole ordeal. The neat thing about overcoming difficult challenges is that they're more memorable. I'll never forget my quest to take down the ferocious Flying Fury. People still talk about Whitney's Mill Tank, Ultra Necrozma, or Sephiroth in Kingdom Hearts to this day for that same reason. So yeah, 
Those are five things Pokemon could learn from Monster Hunter stories too. Have you had a chance to play Monster Hunter yet? Do you think Pokemon will make some or none of these changes? Make sure to leave your thoughts down below. Till next time.